When we look back on the games of yesteryear, we often see the terms masterpiece or genre defining when describing certain titles. Are these accolades truly justified, or are they mere lip service? Well, mount up your Magitek armor, because we're about to examine one such title, and maybe even suplex a locomotive while we're at it. This is Final Fantasy VI. My name's Zio, and I'll be your lore keeper. Our tale begins in 1992. Final Fantasy V was out the door in December of that year, outselling its predecessor within its first week on store shelves. Japan's real estate bubble had burst the previous year as a result of the Bank of Japan raising interest rates in an effort to cool down the white-hot real estate market. The impact of this event is still being felt by the wider economy to this day. Square was still doing very well financially in spite of all this. The Japanese RPG Gold Rush was still going strong, with Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest as its long-standing forerunners. The surge in popularity led other companies with no prior RPG experience to carve out their niche in this market. Countless other RPGs would flood the market with varying degrees of success. With 1993 on the horizon, it was time to break ground on the sixth installment. Several members of the core team from previous titles would return, alongside a few new faces, but things were different this time. This was the first Final Fantasy title where Hironobu Sakaguchi wasn't the director. Final Fantasy had put the company in much better shape financially by this point, which earned Mr. Sakaguchi a promotion to Executive Vice President during Final Fantasy V's development. This new responsibility within the company meant less creative input, but Sakaguchi still served as executive producer, making many contributions to the game's story. Yoshinori Kitase was in the director's chair, with series veteran Hiroyuki Ito as his co-director. Kitase studied screenwriting and filmmaking at Nihon University College of Art and joined Square in 1990 despite having no prior software development experience. Before that, he would stay at home playing video games instead of pounding the pavement looking for a job. He would often go to a local shop and read their gaming magazines, which led him to find the job at Square. Hiroyuki Ito studied at Tokyo Zoke University, which is a private art university in Tokyo. He began his career at Square in 1987 as a playtester for the original Final Fantasy. His real claim to fame was developing the active time battle system which the franchise would use throughout the decade. Renowned artist Yoshitaka Amano would reprise his role as series illustrator. The in-game sprites were once again done by Kazuko Shibuya, who joined Square in 1986. In previous entries, every character had two separate sprite sets, one for on the field and one for in battle. But FF6 would give everyone a single set for both. The larger memory capacity meant greater artistic freedom. Characters were much more expressive, bringing out their unique personalities in both the field and in combat. Tetsuya Nomura and Tetsuya Takahashi would also return alongside Hideo Manaba. Longtime series composer Nobuo Uematsu would deliver what many still consider his magnum opus. The soundtrack consists of themes for every major character and location, as well as upbeat and dramatic battle themes. Uematsu made heavy use of leitmotif throughout the score, giving every scene even more emotional impact. Perhaps the most iconic examples of this are Aria di Mezzo Karatear and Dancing Mad. Both songs have been covered numerous times throughout the years in various styles. A three-disc album containing all 61 tracks from the game was released by NTT Publishing in 1994. Several other albums featuring arranged tracks from the game were also released that year, including an orchestral arrangement called Grand Finale. There was a piano collection, and also a special tracks album featuring music that didn't make it into the final game. Uematsu has stated his satisfaction with the soundtrack in countless interviews over the years. He wasn't satisfied with Grand Finale though since he had no involvement with that project. Not that it was a bad album, it just didn't fit with his vision for the music. Development ran for about a year with a team of around 50 to 60 people. The game launched on time and within budget, but there was still a major crunch near the end. Final Fantasy VI set itself apart from its predecessors in every way. The whimsical high fantasy setting with dragons and crystals has been replaced with a steampunk industrial setting. This time, instead of having the story focus on a single character, every character could be seen as the protagonist. 
The team took a hybrid approach, with Sakaguchi developing the initial story premise centered around a conflict against Imperial forces, much like Final Fantasy II. Writing duties for each character was split up between the core team members, with Sakaguchi keeping a close eye on things to ensure continuity. The game featured an ensemble cast of 14 playable characters, a record not yet broken by any mainline Final Fantasy title. Final Fantasy VI features several complex and well-rounded characters, each having their own story arc throughout the course of the adventure. These were complex and broken people navigating the challenges of the world around them, much like ourselves. FF6 dealt with real-world topics such as totalitarianism, biochemical warfare, the loss of a spouse, depression, and suicide. Of course, that's not to say Cecil and Bart's had easy lives outside of their respective adventures. Both men and their companions faced their own hardships before and during their respective journeys. Final Fantasy VI showed us more details about our heroes' lives than ever before. It served to illustrate the growth of not just the characters on the screen, but the people who created them. Hironobu Sakaguchi himself is a prime example of this. In the time between the development of FF1 and the release of FF6, Mr. Sakaguchi would grow not just as a game developer, but as a man. The main issue with this approach is that some characters received much more attention than others. These less prominent characters would see their story arcs wrap up much sooner. Battles unfolded much like they did in previous entries. Each character had their own unique special abilities, much like the fourth installment. They each had their own desperation attack, which had a chance to activate when they were at low health. This idea would serve as the precursor to limit breaks. Final Fantasy VI offered much more character customization than before outside of a job system. Players could teach magic to characters who couldn't use it naturally through magicites found throughout the game. These magicites also doubled as summons that could be used by the equipping character once per battle. Some even awarded permanent stat bonuses to the equipping character when they leveled up. Players could also equip special accessories called relics that granted special bonuses such as being able to equip a weapon in each hand or eliminating random encounters. The Magicite and Relic systems granted more character customization while having each character retain what made them unique. Final Fantasy VI Square. Once upon a time, a trio of gods descended upon the world and fought amongst themselves for dominance. Those caught in the crossfire were turned into espers and forced to fight for the gods. Once the gods saw the carnage they had wrought, they agreed to seal away their powers, leaving the espers with the instructions, Never must we be woken. The War of the Magi broke out between the espers and humans who had abused their powers, ravaging the entire world. Humanity would slowly rebuild, using technology for their needs, while magic became no more than a fairy tale. But there are those who would rediscover and harness its power for nefarious purposes. A pair of Imperial soldiers named Vix and Wedge, alongside a mysterious young woman, are deployed to Narsh after receiving reports of a frozen esper. Narsh is a center of technology built on the base of a mountain and kept warm by a network of geothermal heaters. The trio pushes their way through town in suits of Magitech armor. The trio discovers the Esper, who emits strange pulses of energy, killing both Vix and Wedge and destroying the woman's Magitech armor. She wakes up in the home of a man named Arvis, who tells her that the others were controlling her through a device called a Slave Crown. She's only able to remember her name, Tara Branford. The town guards arrive to arrest Tara, but Arvis sneaks her out the back door. The guards corner her in the mines, but she falls through the ground and falls unconscious. She then has a flashback of a man named Kefka Palazzo putting the slave crown on her head and then obliterating 50 soldiers at his behest. 
A thief, excuse me, treasure hunter, Locke Cole shows up at Arvis's house. He tells Locke to find Terra and help her skip town. He finds her, but so do the town guards. A group of Moogles comes on the scene to help Locke repel the town guards and take Terra to safety. Locke vows to protect Terra, much to her bewilderment. In the desert kingdom of Figaro, Locke introduces Terra to its flirtatious king, Edgar Roni Figaro. Figaro is allied with the Empire, but in reality, they're part of an anti-imperial group called the Returners, and Locke is the liaison. But then Kefka shows up looking for Terra. Kefka sets the castle on fire the next morning, and the trio escape on chocobos as the castle burrows under the ground. Kefka sends a pair of Imperial soldiers in Magitek armor after them, but Terra fends them off with her magic, much to Edgar and Locke's astonishment. The two men suggest that Terra meet with their leader, Bannon, to gain a better understanding of her abilities. While passing through South Figaro, the trio encounters the enigmatic assassin Shadow, who would slit his mama's throat for a nickel, according to Edgar. While passing through Mount Colts, they meet up with Edgar's brother, Sabin Rene Figaro, after a skirmish with a fellow martial artist. The group meets with Bannon at the hideout to discuss their next move. Bannon seems to believe that Terra just might be their trump card in the fight against the Empire and asks her to join their cause. Terra is understandably conflicted, having spent her entire life as no more than a weapon, but this time it's for the other side. But there's another, more pressing issue. Imperial troops have annexed South Figaro, and they've discovered the hideout's location. It's time to bug out Tanarsh while Locke infiltrates South Figaro to slow the Empire's advance. Sabin is separated from the others after being attacked by Ultros on the way to Narsh. Meanwhile, Terra sneaks back into Narsh alongside Edgar and Bannon and links up with Arvis. Locke sneaks into South Figaro, which is under complete lockdown at this point. The richest man in town was an Imperial informant, and the soldiers commandeer his house as their forward operating base. An Imperial general named Celes Cher is being held underneath the house and is slated to be executed for treason. Locke breaks Celeste out of her prison and helps her leave town, making the same pledge that he made to Terra. Celeste is, obviously, bewildered by this. The duo makes their way to Narsh via the South Figaro cave. Sabin washes up near Doma and encounters Shadow outside of a nearby house. The duo tries to slip through an Imperial camp under the command of General Leo Kristoff. They plan on capturing Doma Castle, but Kefka's there too. A battalion of soldiers rolls up on Doma Castle, but their commander is beaten by their country's strongest swordsman, Cyan Garamonde. The other soldiers beat a hasty retreat soon after. General Leo is called back to Vector, and Kefka poisons the nation's water supply, killing everyone including Cyan's wife and son. An enraged Cyan storms the camp on his own, but Sabin and Shadow come to his aid, and the trio escapes into the nearby forest. They come across a rather enigmatic locomotive, which is actually the Phantom Train, meant to ferry the dead to the other side. After that ordeal, the trio sees everyone that died in Doma climb aboard the train, including Cyan's wife and son. The trio makes their way to Baron Falls, then Shadow dips. Sabin and Cyan jump down the waterfall and end up in the town of Mobles, near the Velt. They befriend the feral youth Gao, who shows them a special treasure of his as a token of his thanks. They use this special treasure, which allows them to brave the Serpent Trench, which leads them to the town of Nikia. From there, it's off to South Figaro, and finally, Narsh. The gang's all here in Narsh, including Locke and Sabin's new companions who make their introductions. Locke tips the others off to the impending raid on Narsh. Kefka and his crew are en route. They want that Esper, by any means necessary. But he and his goons are soon sent packing. The frozen Esper is at the top of the mountain, and Terra has questions. Oh look, there's that energy again, and Terra turns into a glowing pink monster and flies off screaming. The team splits up once again. One group stands guard in Narish, while the other goes to look for Terra. Terra's in Zozo, under the care of Ramu the Esper. Ramu tells the story of the War of the Magi and the Imperial Raid on their home. He's the one that called Terra over here when he sensed that her powers had awakened. Ramu and other espers managed to flee the Imperial capital of Vector, but three of them were turned into Magicite. We need to save the other espers. Next stop, Vector. But how do we get there? Sea travel is out of the question, though. 
There's a man in Jador named Impresario. He has a little problem here. There's a wandering gambler named Setzer Gabbiani, who also happens to own the world's only private airship. The Impresario fears that Setzer might try to abduct the star of his opera, Maria. Celeste looks an awful lot like this Maria person, which gives Locke an idea. The plan is simple. Use Celeste as a decoy for the real Maria to draw out Setzer and steal his airship. Wait a minute, can Celeste even sing? Well, it turns out, she can, in perhaps one of the most iconic scenes in all of Final Fantasy. This would also be a major turning point for Celeste's character. Everything goes swimmingly, that is, until Ultro shows up and everything goes completely off the rails. Setzer takes the bait, along with our decoy Maria. Locke and the others sneak on board the ship, and Setzer is hustled into cooperating with the Returners. The idea for Setzer actually started in Final Fantasy V with a gambler named Eva, but that character ended up being reworked into Ferris. Inside the Magitek research facility, they encounter Ifrit and Shiva, as well as the other espers. The other espers, weakened from the experiments, turn themselves into Magisite. They meet the man responsible for the Magitek project, Sid Del Norte Marguez. Back in Zozo, one of the Magisites seems to resonate with Terra. That Magisite was her father, Maduin, and Terra regains her memories. The Imperial Magitech project was the result of a raid on the Esper world. The Empire captured several Espers during that assault, including Baby Terra, who was half human, half Esper. What if the Espers could help in the fight with the Empire? Humans and Espers don't get along, but Terra's very existence bucks that notion. Soon after that conversation, they befriend a Moogle named Mog. Terra and the others reach the sealed gate but so does Kafka. The door opens and the espers come flying out. They go berserk and trash vector in the process. Now the Empire wants a truce. Gestal holds a banquet with the Returners to discuss the next steps. He enlists the aid of Terra and the others to find the espers on Crescent Island and tell them the war is over. A few Returners stay in vector to keep an eye on things. Something doesn't seem right. The search leads Terra and company to the backwater town of the Masa, whose townspeople are rather tight-lipped. They meet the elderly blue mage, Strago Magus, and his adopted granddaughter, the Pictomancer, Rel Maroni. Strago comes clean after the others help him save Realm from a burning house. The Masa was established as an enclave for the descendants of the ancient Magi. We find the Espers, but then Kefka shows up and goes on a massive Magisite killing spree. General Leo even gets whacked. Turns out the whole truce thing was a ruse to get the door open. The duo finds the statues, and the continent ominously rises into the sky. 
Our heroes catch up to Kefka and Gestal on the floating continent, but it's already too late. Gestal tells Celeste that she and Kefka were born to rule the world alongside him. In the Japanese version, he suggests that Celeste and Kefka procreate to raise the next generation of Magitek soldiers in this new world. By this point, Kefka had gone completely insane. He was patient zero in the Magitek experiment. The process hadn't been perfected yet. It gave him great magical power at the cost of his sanity. Gestal had all the power he wanted, but never once considered that he would be brought down by the very weapon that he created. That hubris cost him his life. Kefka starts moving the statues and all hell breaks loose. It's time to make a mad dash back to the Blackjack. With the airship just below and the continent falling apart, a quandary presents itself. Do we jump or do we wait for Shadow? The very world itself is being torn asunder due to the magical imbalance, killing scores of people in the process. Even the Blackjack is torn to pieces, scattering everyone to parts unknown. The bad guys had won. On that day, the world was changed forever. A year later, Celeste is on a solitary island with Sid, who is like a grandfather to her. He's not doing so great right now. Despite her best efforts, Celeste is unable to save Sid, who succumbs to his illness. Here stands a broken woman. Her friends, and now her adopted grandfather, are gone. That leaves one option. It's time to end it all on the Northern Cliff. Wait, what's up with this bird? Is that Locke's bandana? Is Locke still alive? Does this mean the others are still around too? It turns out Sid's been secretly working on a raft this whole time, and Celeste uses it to escape to civilization. Or what's left of it. It's possible to save Sid, but it doesn't have any bearing on the story. Kefka is now essentially the god of this world, and he's built himself a massive tower in the center of the continent. He's been zapping cities with a power called the Light of Judgment, turning in on those who oppose him, or just out of sheer boredom. Celeste finds Edgar and Nikia, who's been posing as the leader of a gang of thieves called the Crimson Robbers to get back to Figaro Castle. We find Setzer at the bar in Colingen. Here's a broken man who's lost everything. Losing his airship cut him deeply. While he is happy to see his friend still alive, he feels that there isn't much he can do. In his words, he's just a gambler. But the house had won, and he'd cashed in what little he had left. There's not enough liquor in the world that can drown his sorrows. Celeste manages to break him out of this funk. Turns out he's been holding on to a trump card this whole time. Another airship, the Falcon. It's time to bring the crew back together, and perhaps a yeti named Dumaro and a mime named Gogo might like to tag along. Now it's off to Kefka's tower to take down this nihilistic psychopath once and for all. Okay, kid, show me what you got. Yeah, right. Next! Yes! Next! Ooh, scary. Next! 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 Final Fantasy 3. Do you have what it takes? Final Fantasy 3 from Squaresoft. Next! Next! 
On Saturday, April 2nd, 1994, Final Fantasy VI hit store shelves in Japan, retailing for 11,400 yen. The game would go on to sell 2.5 million copies, making it the best-selling home console game in Japan that year. Gaming publications of the time showcased the game in the months leading up to its release, including elements that were cut from the final product. There was even a VHS tape with a song by the developers. Weekly Famitsu gave it a cross score of 37 out of 40, which was the highest score given to a Final Fantasy title at that time. The reviewers gushed over the sound and visuals as well as the storytelling. Famitsu would give the game generous coverage in the coming weeks. Several guidebooks were published featuring detailed walkthroughs of the game as well as massive lore dumps not found within the game. One of these books was written by Kaori Tanaka herself. The book expands on the backgrounds of the Figaro brothers as well as their family tree. She does however state this book isn't meant to be taken as canon. Final Fantasy VI was renamed Final Fantasy III to fit with the numbering scheme established by its predecessors in that territory. That designation would have gone to Final Fantasy V had it not been skipped over for localization. Western gamers would get their first look at the game in April 1994 thanks to Nintendo Power. But unlike with FF4, there would be no significant changes to the gameplay. But the road to localization was certainly a rocky one to say the least. This is once again where Ted Woolsey comes in. This was the man responsible for localization and marketing at Square in the early 90s. Woolsey joined Square in 1991 shortly after finishing his master's degree in Japanese literature. Final Fantasy VI would be his most notable work, and perhaps his most challenging. The localization process began shortly after the original Japanese version was completed. He was handed a game cartridge and the files, and given a scant 30 days to complete the project. The goal was to finish by late summer with a 2-3 month cartridge manufacturing window. Not only was Woolsey racing the clock here, but he was also up against storage limits and Nintendo of America's draconian censorship policies at the time. It took Woolsey several attempts to fit the translated text within the allotted cartridge space while being as clear and concise as possible. There were also witty pop culture references that he couldn't include for legal reasons. And I pounded through that as fast as I could, and unfortunately my first uh, deliverable to Tokyo, they took it and saw that it was three or four hundred percent too big. Hmm. And I was dumb, dumbfounded because I tried to be very concise, and I think I did a pretty good translation. I, I, I felt, you know, really good about having captured sort of the, a lot of the scatological humor, which of course would have had to be expunged anyways for Nintendo's purposes. But um, and you know some of the references, pop culture and stuff that I thought were pretty cool, kind of clever, but which we ended up having to ditch too, just for you know for for branding and, and licensing and you know registration issues and stuff. Several lines of dialogue containing profanity or scatological humor had to be removed in accordance with Nintendo standards. Direct references to death also had to be cleaned up. Dancing around these guidelines was also a major hurdle. A prime example of this would be Celeste's suicide attempt in the World of Ruin. The original version doesn't beat around the bush saying that people jumped off the cliff to end their lives in despair. The original Super NES version said that people took a leap of faith off that cliff and it perked them right up. The translated version makes it sound like those people took up cliff diving as a hobby for an adrenaline rush, but if you watch the moments leading up to this scene, it's abundantly clear what's happening here. Another instance is Dwayne and Katarine in Mobliz, both of whom are 16. The issue of teen pregnancy was a rather dicey one in the 90s, as well as a popular topic for daytime talk show hosts of that era. Woolsey made them into a married couple, which allowed him to skirt the issue while preserving the core theme. Of course, references to alcohol and religion had to be cut out here. The pubs were now cafes, Holy was now Pearl, and let's not forget several enemies had to be changed to cover up excess skin. While Ted Woolsey's translation may not have been the greatest, it was certainly serviceable. Calling it a bastardization, as some have done over the years, is quite unfair. Especially when you consider what the man had to deal with. Let's not forget one thing here. Nintendo was the king of the console market in the early 90s, especially with RPGs. Naturally, if you're a game developer, you want your game on the console with the highest player base. Especially when you're trying to raise awareness of an entire genre in another part of the world. In Nintendo's case, that meant following their content rules for releasing games outside of Japan, which were more or less non-negotiable. 
you either played ball or your game wasn't coming out at all. After a tumultuous localization process, Final Fantasy VI hit North American store shelves as Final Fantasy III on October 11th, 1994. Nintendo Power gave it generous coverage in the last quarter of 1994. Unlike Final Fantasy IV, they were much more aggressive about promoting it, despite not being featured on the front cover. They gave it high marks for its sound and visuals, as well as its myriad side quests. However, they did feel the story was often sappy and not written for American audiences. Nintendo Power also published an in-depth player's guide with detailed maps and item lists. The game was on the magazine's top SNES titles for a solid 48 months. Its predecessor spent a whopping 72 months on those charts. Of course, other publications praised the game for those same reasons. Electronic Gaming Monthly gave it their Editor's Choice Platinum Award in October of 1994. The reviewers gave it 9s across the board for a total of 36 out of 40. The original US version had two major hurdles at its release. It had the dubious honor of being sandwiched between the Super NES port of Mortal Kombat 2 and Donkey Kong Country. On top of that, RPGs weren't exactly mainstream at that time. Final Fantasy VI was ported to the PlayStation in 1999 by Tose, adding in a quick save feature plus FMV sequences at the beginning and the end of the game. Tose was founded in 1979 and became known as a ghost developer over the years. Whether you realize it or not, you've actually played several of their games. It was released in North America in September of that year as part of the Final Fantasy anthology alongside FF5. The PlayStation port kept the original Woolsey translation but rolled back the changes that were made to stay with the Nintendo of America's content policies. But like with the other ports, FF6 suffered from lengthy load times and muffled sound effects. In the early 2000s, the rift between Square and Nintendo would heal in the wake of Microsoft entering the console market. Square would merge with their longtime rival Enix soon after. Square Enix would go on to release their 16-bit Final Fantasy titles on the Game Boy Advance, as well as the first two entries in the series. Development of these titles was once again farmed out to our friends at Tose, with FF6 appearing near the end of 2006 in Japan and everywhere else the following year. The GBA port received a brand new localization by Tom Slattery, making use of the Japanese naming conventions for magic and enemies. The color palette was made brighter than its Super NES counterpart to compensate for the lack of a backlight. The GBA port also features new espers and new spells. There's also a challenging new dungeon called the Dragon's Den, featuring the Kaiser Dragon as its final boss. We'll wrap back around to that momentarily. The GBA port was very well received by gaming press and fans alike. In 2014, the game was ported to iOS and Android devices by Matrix Software. This was essentially a straight port of the GBA version, but with redone visuals. The redesigned character sprites weren't very well received though. The menus received a complete overhaul with touch controls in mind. In 2016, this version was ported over to Steam with added controller support. 2022 saw the release of the Pixel Remaster on mobile platforms and Steam simultaneously. The other ports were subsequently taken down from their respective stores. The Pixel Remaster would fix the bugs in earlier versions and update the visuals to be more in line with the original Super Famicom version. The aesthetic here was far less polarizing than the original mobile versions. The soundtrack was also remixed, just like the other Pixel Remasters. However, the bonus content from later versions was absent. The iconic Opera House scene received an HD 2D glow-up, along with actual vocals. The Pixel Remasters made their way onto PlayStation and Switch in 2023. There's been talk of remaking Final Fantasy VI as of late, and quite a few people at Square Enix want to make it happen. But Kitase recently came out and said that a remake of FF6 on par with the ongoing FF7 remake project would take around 20 years. Will this ever come to pass? Only time will tell. Ah, look. Yatto atto. Final Fantasy. Kaitai ki kanzen shoku keikaku. Iyoyo climax e. Final Fantasy VI Advance. Finest box atteru. Just like any other game, FF6 has no shortage of fun facts. Like any piece of software, FF6 has its share of bugs and glitches. The debugging process was especially challenging. The sketch glitch was perhaps the most infamous bug in the entire franchise. 
It happens whenever Rome misses the enemy she's supposed to sketch. The bug has a chance to fill up your inventory with powerful items or corrupt your save data. The most common side effect is graphical glitches. The trick is often used by speedrunners, allowing them to skip a huge chunk of the game. The World of Ruin wasn't part of the initial plan for the game. The Floating Continent was to be the game's final dungeon, but development was going smoother than expected. The Phantom Train is one of the most memorable bosses in the game. One of Sabin's Blitz's Meteor Strike, renamed Suplex in the original translation, involved him picking up enemies and slamming them onto the ground. Doing this to a locomotive weighing several tons is all the more absurd. The train suplex was elevated to meme status in 2008 when a video called The Best Moment in Final Fantasy VI was uploaded to YouTube. Square Enix even acknowledged the meme on their social media accounts celebrating the game's 27th anniversary. Speaking of Sabin, professional wrestler Josh Harder took the ring name Chris Sabin as a nod to our favorite train suplexing monk. The Kaiser Dragon from the GBA and mobile ports was cut from the original game despite having opening dialogue that was translated into English. It still exists within the game, but it can't be fought normally, and there's no AI script. The opera scene in the Pixel Remaster was given actual vocals in multiple languages, including Spanish and Korean. The English vocals were sung by Hannah Grace, who had no prior experience with opera. There's been no shortage of speculation about Gogo's identity over the past three decades. Some have claimed that it was Setzer's girlfriend Daryl who disappeared when the Falcon crashed. Others say it was Gestal. Others have gone so far as to say it was General Leo. Others have even suggested that Gogo was Shadow's old partner, Barum. A more plausible theory is that this is the same Gogo from Final Fantasy V, a connection that would have been lost on Western gamers in the mid-90s, since FF5 was skipped over at first. But Yoshinori Kitase would put those theories to rest when he told Kotaku in 2017 that Umaro and Gogo had no backstory and were simply put there to be used in battle. Did you know any of these? In my other retrospective videos, I've mostly stayed away from sharing my personal experiences with the games I've covered. But then I realized I had to have some kind of impetus for pouring so much time and effort into projects that often took several months. These videos are open love letters to the games that have helped to make me who I am today, and this game is no exception. When I first played FF6, it was the Japanese version using a machine that copied Super NES games onto floppy disks that my dad bought for me during a trip to Singapore. This was a few months before it came out in the States. I bumbled my way through the game, but got stuck at the part where you had to use Pummel on Vargas. I couldn't read Japanese at the time, so I didn't understand what I was supposed to do, and the death counter always killed me. I got my hands on the US version early the following year, and I was blown away by the experience. After revisiting the game multiple times as an adult, I find the characters to be all the more relatable. Sure it has its issues, but it's still one of my all-time favorites. As for a remake? I'll have to pass on that. Many of the people involved with the original will have either retired or passed on by the time that project is completed. It just wouldn't be the same. Then you have things like ESG, DEI, ethics boards, and other craziness that has plugged the FF7 remake project. Again, I must say, no. Don't ruin something that's helped get me through my tumultuous middle and high school years. If you made it all the way here, comment with your favorite Final Fantasy VI memories. And remember, to thine own self be true. Until next time, farewell.